Okay, we're about to kick off our next session. Professor Robert Waxter is Professor and Interim Chairman of the Department of Medicine at the University of California. Known as the Digital Doctor, he was asked by the Secretary of State for Health, Jeremy Hunt, to carry a review into the use of digital in the NHS. This review will inform the way IT is implemented to support healthcare. In particular, the use of electronic health records and other digital systems in the acute sector to achieve our ambition of a paper-free NHS by 2020. We're thrilled this morning that Bob is today delivering his report and we are going to be the first to hear it. So please give him a warm round of applause. Thank you. Good afternoon, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I've spent a fair amount of time in the last year uh, here in England studying the National Health Service and thinking about information technology. I am uh, constantly asked, if, uh, as an American, if, uh, if I can explain Donald Trump. The answer is I cannot, so uh, don't ask that question. I'm uh, going to talk about what our findings were, talk about the committee, how we did our process, and then uh, end with our recommendations. The findings of the committee have now been published and are, uh, are online uh, for your review later. So uh, let me go ahead and, and get started. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of background to the report, a little bit of background about my own uh, career and how this uh, endeavor began, and then uh, talk about what our findings and recommendations are. I think it's, very, it, it's fair to say that the backdrop for the report was that the prior effort to digitize the National Health Service, uh, particularly the trusts in the form of the National Program for Information Technology, which launched in 2002, ended in 2011, and largely failed to meet its goals of digitizing the trust. It did have certain, leave behind certain uh, uh, positive things, including digital radiology and the spine and the NHS number for patients, uh, but the goal of digitizing the entire NHS was not met. Uh, on the other hand, digitizing the GP sector has actually gone quite well, and you should recognize that the state of digitization in the GP sector here is truly world class, is as good as anything uh, that, that exists in other countries and is actually better than exists in my own country. The five-year forward view uh, clearly demanded another effort at digitization and, uh, and interoperability, making all of the records weave together in, in terms of meeting the ultimate goals for the national health system. Uh, there was a fair amount of preparatory work in the form of the National Information Board, the Digital Maturity Assessment. So when we were asked to come in and begin to look at the National Health Service digitization, it wasn't like uh, there had been uh, no work done preparing. There was a fair amount of work already done. And very importantly, uh, the Treasury had allocated 4.2 billion pounds to support NHS digitization. That was announced uh, by the Secretary of State for Health, Jeremy Hunt, who is uh, actually here. Uh, uh, soon after our report began its work. It's also important to say that the U.S. has had considerable experience with digitization. I'm going to spend a few minutes telling you about that experience because some of my own background and some of the background uh, that led to our committee's work related to the U.S. U.S.'s past experience with this as well. So let me tell you a little bit about what happened in the United States. In 2008-2009, uh, uh, we were primarily uh, a, a paper-based uh, health system. And this is a, uh, as you can well imagine, true here, uh, these are the most complex organizations that anyone has ever seen. Uh, they're all about information, and yet information moved around on pieces of paper, stored in three-ring binders, uh, fax machines, post-it notes, not a reasonable way of, uh, of, of moving information around in an extraordinarily important enterprise like healthcare. So only about 10% of American hospitals were digital in, uh, in 2009. We, we talk about EHRs, electronic health records. You sometimes refer to them as EPRs. In uh, 2010, you see a little bit of an uptick, but what's striking here is over the last five or six years, we have gone from primarily a paper-based healthcare system to primarily a digital healthcare system. How did that happen? It happened because our federal government in the United States put $30 billion into digitizing the healthcare system. It may sound like a lot of money, but if you think about our healthcare system, it's five or six times the size of yours. 
the $30 billion certainly didn't pay for uh, hospitals to buy digital systems. By the way, the $30 billion was not only for hospitals, it was all f also for outpatient practices. So a, if you think about it, not a huge investment led to essentially complete digitization of the American healthcare system, and we're out now up to about 90% of American hospitals have uh, advanced electronic health records. So this is really a striking success story. How did we find $30 billion in our dysfunctional political environment? It was because in 2008, our economy imploded. There was a $700 billion stimulus package to try to get the economy rolling again. And there were some smart health policy analysts who said, now is our moment. They dipped into that pie of $700 billion, found $30 billion to support digitizing the healthcare system. And I think this is a striking success story. There's another piece of the story that I think turns out to be just as interesting and I think uh, will happen here as well. The $30 billion went to hospitals and went to doctors to help support and subsidize their purchase of electronic health record systems. And that's what it did, and most hospitals like my own bought vendor build or supplier built systems like Epic or Cerner or other systems and put them into their practices. But what it also did was stimulate Silicon Valley, where I live, I live in San Francisco, to say now is our moment to get involved in healthcare. And so, although none of the $30 billion went to the Apples and the Googles and all the startups in the environment, there is now a tremendous amount of energy going into consumer-facing information technology in the form of patient portals and apps and sensors. Why is that happening now? Because all of those companies have been waiting for healthcare to become digital, and now is the moment. So they have seen an opportunity, and you're beginning to see a little bit of this happen in England as well. Again, none of the $30 billion went to this effort, but they see that now is the time healthcare is going digital. It's our time to get involved. Now, I depict the analogy here is that of the transcontinental railroad. At this point, this is mostly two sets of tracks being built that don't connect particularly well. One set of tracks being the enterprise electronic health records, the other being the Fitbits and the other apps and sensors that are being built largely by consumer-based companies. But we are working very hard in the United States on what, by analogy, is laying the golden spike in, in tying these tracks together. And when it does, I think that's when things really get interesting. Why do I say that? I say that because in every other industry, once the economy was fully digital, that's when you began, began to see remarkable innovation. That's when the Ubers happened. That's when the Airbnbs happened. That's when the Amazons happened. When you have a complete digital economy, all of a sudden new models of, of delivering whatever the services are unleashed. And I believe that is what we will see in England, we're beginning to see in the United States as you have the enterprise systems, GP offices, hospitals wired, but also the consumer part of information technology wired and all of these pieces connecting. Now, I've told you about the happy part of the American story, and that is we've gone from largely a paper-based system to a digital system over a very few years. Uh, what could go wrong? Well, a fair number of things have gone wrong, and I don't want to paint a picture that we have completely figured this out in the United States. Actually, in many ways, we found some really striking unanticipated consequences. And part of why I believe uh, uh, Secretary Hunt and, and others asked us to do this report was there is a lot to learn, not only from your own past experiences in digitization, but from our experiences as well. So let me tell you about a few of the th things that surprised me at least and have not gone as well as, as, as we had hoped. Uh, although I think these are all uh, overcomable. Uh, this is one of them. We put in electronic health records in doctor's offices and in hospitals, and, uh, and so now the doctors, of course, are spending a fair amount of their time uh, typing their notes into the electronic health records. A seven-year-old girl a few years ago uh, drew a picture of her recollection of her visit to her pediatrician she sent it in, or the, the pediatrician sent it into the journal of the American Medical Association. And here it is, you see the girl, her mother, uh, her sister, and there in the corner with his back to the patient is the doctor typing away. I think this is a magnificent picture. It's wonderful and it's scary. Uh, there's one thing that the girl got wrong and that is the smile on the doctor's face because I can tell you that the physicians are not happy about spending so much of their time and energy feeding 
the electronic health record. And in fact, the fastest growing profession in American medicine are scribes. These are people being hired by emergency departments, GP offices, basically young people to type into the computer so the doctor and the patient can look each other in the eye again. That's not good. It describes to me are a workaround and demonstrate that we really haven't gotten it exactly right, what the interface is. The future here, of course, will involve speech recognition, natural language processing, but we're not there yet. So that's one of the unanticipated consequences. The doctors paying, in some ways, more attention to the computers than the patients. We have to fix that. Here's another. This is the, uh, where I work at the University of California, San Francisco. This is the room where the residents, our junior doctors, kind of hang out and do all their computer work. And it is filled day and night with junior doctors, senior doctors, doing all of their electronic work, eating very bad old food. That's fine. It's very collegial. It's very collaborative. But then when you go out to the hospital ward, that's what it looks like. It's empty because the doctors, the minute they're done seeing their patients, leave the ward to go to their separate room to do their computer work. Now, in some ways, that was obvious in retrospect, but we didn't predict it. And because we didn't predict it, we didn't do anything to deal with it. It has gotten in the way of the relationships between the nurses and the doctors, because the nurses, of course, are tethered to the floor, whereas now the doctors leave the floor to do their computer work. An example just of the kinds of unanticipated impact of technology on workflow and relationships, things that you need to understand, try to anticipate, mitigate if you're going to get this right. This is the era, this is the time where I knew things had gone completely off the rails, at least in the United States. This was an advertisement that I found in 2014 for an emergency medicine, an A&E job uh, in the, our state of Arizona. It begins Arizona General Hospital. We will be coming to the Grand Canyon State. It's located a Phoenix suburb. It's a 40,000 square foot boutique general hospital. That sounds nice. And here's what they had in the advertisement. Remember, they're advertising for a doctor. They have an emergency room, which is good if you're trying to hire an ER doctor, you want to have an emergency room. Uh, they have a radiology suite with the latest toys, two state-of-the-art operating rooms, outpatient surgery. This is a little tiny hospital, 16 inpatient rooms. But the only part of the advertisement that was in bold, clearly their main selling point, was they have no electronic medical record. So this is all to say that we have not gotten it completely right, but I think we've learned a lot of lessons along the way. Uh, I spent the better part of a year, two years ago, trying to understand those lessons and going around the country researching it, talking to uh, vendors, to CEOs of companies, to frontline doctors, nurses, patients, wrote a book about it. Uh, and as you see here, I have a very large administrative role. I study patient safety and quality, but I also am a practicing uh, physician in hospital medicine. And, uh, and also had at least a passing familiarity with the National Health Service. I spent six months here in 2011 under a Fulbright scholarship studying patient safety at Imperial. So that was the background. Here are some of the key findings that I learned in writing this book and studying IT that certainly influenced our report. I think that we're in a world now, both in the United States and in the UK, where there are two twin transformational pressures. One of them is we are clearly, and you are clearly, under tremendous pressure to deliver what we're calling high value care as shorthand. High value care means more satisfying, higher quality, less variation, safer, and at a lower cost. So no question there are dominant pressures. You're feeling them, we're feeling them. There's no doubt about it. The second is that we are shifting from a paper-based healthcare system to a digital healthcare system. As you see in the United States, we've already done that over the past five years. In the UK, I think you're beginning to do that now and will complete that over the next several years and have largely com completed it in the GP sector. If you ask me today, what is the bigger issue? What's the issue that consumes me in my job running a very large department? There's no question. It's the high value care pressure. How do we deliver care that's better, safer, less expensive, more satisfying? If you ask me 10 years ago, I have absolutely no doubt that the digitization of our healthcare systems will have been the bigger and more transformational trends. Why? Because look at every other industry and how they've been transformed by digitization, whether it's financial services, manufacturing, travel, entertainment. My wife is a journalist. I've seen what that has done to the, the, to the uh, profession of journalism. There is no question in my mind that once we become fully digital, 
it will unleash transformational trends that mostly are good, although will be challenging for us to grapple with. That is why it is so important to get digitization done, to get it done thoughtfully, to link up all the pieces of the system. That doesn't get the job done, but that creates the scaffolding for enormous transformation. A Couple of lessons from my research in, in, in writing my book that then I'm going to shift into what we found here. The first big lesson was that we treated and we tend to treat technology and healthcare as technical change, like the same way you download an app to your iPhone and you don't even read the instructions and it's easy and it's good and all of a sudden you're, you're hailing Uber or you're making a restaurant reservation. It seems straightforward. But healthcare IT is the furthest thing in the world from technical change where you follow a recipe. It is what's known as adaptive change of the highest order, adaptive change in the words of uh, Ron Heifetz at Harvard. Those are problems that require people themselves to change and adaptive problems, the people are the problem and the people are the solution. And leadership is about mobilizing and engaging them with the problem rather than trying to anesthetize them so you can go off and solve it on your own. And if you look at the, 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 the problems of NPFIT, this may be the biggest one. There were others, but it really was treating uh, health IT as a technical problem, not getting frontline people engaged in solving the problems in their own daily work. That simply can't work in something like health IT. I'd say the second key lesson that I found in my research was that of the productivity paradox. Productivity paradox is a term coined by MIT professor Eric Brynjolfsson, who wrote in 1993 about the experience of industry after industry after they went from paper-based to digital. He was not talking about healthcare because clearly we had not done that in 1993. He was talking about manufacturing, financial services, and the lesson in all of these uh, industries was technology came in, huge promises that it would make things better and more productive and, and, and cheaper, and a few years would go by and not all that much would happen. And people were left scratching their heads. Why isn't technology working? And, and this was captured very well in this quote from this Nobel Prize winning economist who in 1986 said, you can see the computer age everywhere except in the productivity statistics. We have computers all over the building, but they're not yielding the benefits that we hope for. What's interesting about the productivity paradox is it gets better, but it takes years. Sometimes five, sometimes 10. You have to get started because it's going to take that many years. What are the keys to solving the productivity paradox? Well, it turns out that the research from other industries show that there are two keys. One is clearly the technology needs to get better. And if you've used a healthcare electronic health record system, you know that these systems are not particularly mature or advanced. The technology clearly needs to get better. But that is not the most important key for technology's uh, role in transforming the business. The key is that the work needs to be reimagined. People on the front lines need to see their work, see the technology and say, why are we doing it this way? And the answer was, well, we always did it this way and we've just now digitized it. And smart, particularly young people, this is why you need young people come in and say, well, that's crazy. Why don't we do it a whole different way, taking advantage of the technology? They look at the, the notes, they look at the way we communicate with patients, they come up with brand new ways of thinking about the work, that is when you see the massive transformation. That is why the people are so important to getting this done, not simply the technology. Those are two key lessons. Let me shift now into what our report found and how it happened. Say, this is really how the report happened. This is the Secretary of State for Health, Jeremy Hunt, visiting UCSF Medical Center uh, in September uh, 2015, so exactly a year ago. He's standing in front of a monitor in one of our patients' rooms. The monitor has the name of the kids, uh, this is our children's hospital, the, the child's doctor, uh, has the child's problem list, the medications, uh, has an opportunity for the child or more likely the parents to have questions so that, that they want the clinician to address. It's a very advanced system. I believe that Jeremy and his team were very impressed by what we had done. He's also uh, uh, there carrying my book, I'm pleased to say. Good, good bit of marketing. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, and uh, he and his team called a little while after and asked me to help learn from the past experiences, not only that we'd had in the US, but also the UK, and asked me to chair an advisory group, which was a great honor, and I, I very readily said, uh, said that I'd be thrilled to do that. Uh, we put together a team. This is the team. I'm not gonna go through all of them, 
but you may know some of them. It's a mixed international team of folks from the US and from the UK. It is experts in informatics, experts in health policy, experts in clinical medicine, nursing, pharmacy, uh, patient representatives, representatives from healthcare charities. It turned out to be a spectacularly good team. All of these individuals volunteered their time and put in a tremendous amount of time. I'm, I'm immensely grateful to them. Uh, Harpreet Sood, who's here somewhere, Dr. Harpreet Sood, was the staff to our committee and did a tremendous job pulling things together. We had enormous support from the Department of Health and from the National Health Service, and then people could not have been nicer and more supportive. The idea in the US that we would have asked someone from the UK to run an advisory panel, we're far too arrogant to have done that. So I was incredibly impressed by the uh, level of enthusiasm and support that we received, and I'm, I'm truly grateful for it. What did we do? We had 10 two-hour phone meetings. We had a two-day in-person meeting here in England. Uh, I made site visits to four trusts. We had meetings with multiple stakeholder groups, and I and or members of the committee met with about 100 different individuals from really every walk of life that we could think of that was relevant to our work. Let me give you 10 of the insights that I and we had that we thought related to our findings. I presented these before. We went through sort of an uncomfortable period where we were supposed to present our report actually in this building uh, at, uh, at the Confederation meeting in June. We got delayed because of the Brexit uh, vote, so I had to run around for two or three months talking about our findings, but not our recommendations. So these were our findings that I think are relevant to our recommendations, which I'll talk about in a second. The purpose of digitization is not to digitize, it's to improve care. So if you focus on just the computers, you're getting it wrong. Clinician and buy-in buy -in and engagement are absolutely essential. These are not nice-to-haves. These are essential, and you see why as I talk about adaptive change. In the US, as I've already mentioned, a national program that, unlike NPFIT, was not making central choices about which IT system to buy and sending them off to a trust a few hundred uh, miles away, but rather gave the individual hospitals and doctor's offices the opportunity to buy whichever system they wanted and use dollars from the government to help subsidize the cost, did not pay the full cost, led to an uh, enormous amount of uptake, and, and we went from 10% to more than 90% digital in five years. So that success, I believe, did influence our recommendations. That said, you do have a national health system, and the advantages of that should be leveraged, and part of the challenges here were the lesson of NPFIT was this was way too centralized, I think it would have been a mistake to say, okay, everything should be local. The balance was important. You should centralize things that should be centralized, where there are economies of scale, but clearly there needed to be much more local involvement, engagement, choice than was present under NPFIT. So our mantra here was learn, but don't overlearn the lessons of NPFIT. The government's tendency to overregulate IT should be resisted. This was a problem in the United States where our government got involved because of the $30 billion and began immediately promulgating a set of regulations known as meaningful use that got very deeply into the weeds. Government is not good at this. It's not good at regulating technology. Technology moves along too quickly, and our government just in the last year has basically announced the ending of that program called meaningful use. They're pulling way back on their regulations. There clearly need to be some large regulations around privacy and security and promoting interoperability, but in terms of telling your trust or telling the vendor what the font should look like or what color you should use, no, they, they will not get it right. And I think the government needs to be wise and have a, a light touch when it comes to regulation of IT. Few more, interoperability is crucial for many reasons, so it's important to bake it in from the beginning. We did not do this in the US, and in retrospect, that was a mistake. So we had 6,000 hospitals each buy an IT system, and now we're trying to weave them together we would have been smarter to weave in some of the standards from the very beginning. User-centered design must be a core value, very, very important. IT systems need to evolve and mature. You need a workforce that can allow you to do that. The work is not done when you've bought a supplier system and turned the switch on. The work is simply beginning. You have to have the people at the level of the trust and the practice that can evolve the IT system to make it work. There also needs to be some tolerance for the messy early days of IT implementation. The most striking example we saw was that of Addenbrooke's in Cambridge, where when I came over my first time, I heard about what a disaster the implementation had been at Addenbrooke's. 
And then I began meeting people who said, oh, it's actually working pretty well now, two and a half, three years later. And we went and visited Adam Brooks. And I have to say, it was probably the most impressive IT implementation that I saw of the trusts I visited. And the problem, of course, is the first year was messy, because the first year is messy. First year was messy at my place. It was messy at Harvard. It was messy at Johns Hopkins. It was messy at Duke. It was messy at Mayo. It's messy everywhere. And if government regulators see the messiness and some budget overruns or some, some targets that are missed in the first year and they come swooping in and shut you down and the newspapers proclaim this to be a fiasco, well, that's, nobody's going to get, get that right. So there has to be some tolerance for those early days. The IT system is just the backbone. You have to have the culture, people, and flexibility to innovate, reimagine the people and processes on that backbone. That's adaptive change. And finally, be careful about overpromising. Remember the productivity paradox. This does take time to realize all of the benefits. And in that was a little bit of tension around some of the, uh, the statements about how quickly this could work. I recognize the, the need to kind of get people enthusiastic, but it's also important to recognize you don't implement an IT system and immediately begin saving oodles of money. It takes some time for all of these things to mature. So let me then sort of segue to what our recommendations are. Again, they are available online. Uh, but here are, are the two main areas that we focused on, the implementation plan and the workforce issues. There are 10 major recommendations. I'll briefly run through them at the end. But let me focus most of my attention on the implementation plan and the issues of, uh, of workforce. Implementation plan. There had been some preliminary work on digital maturity within uh, the NHS and, and some very good work. But at least when we came in and met with a whole lot of people, there was no clarity on who would get this 4.2 billion pounds, how much money individual trust would get, how it was going to be allocated, when it was going to be allocated. We thought that it was going to be very important to achieve some clarity on that. Our biggest worry, frankly, was that 4.2 billion pounds sounds like a lot of money, but it's not a lot of money to digitize the entire health system, particularly if you're trying to rush through and get it done in a few years. And as we began to think about Paperless 2020, we fully understood that this was an aspirational goal. But the idea of trying to digitize the entire National Health Service in three years with 4.2 billion pounds, with the state of many trusts in deficit and a lot of angst at, within the trusts and cultural issues, we thought that there was a reasonable chance that that would fail. Too little money, not enough time. And one of our mantras was, it's, if it fails, it will fail differently than, than NPFIT, but it could fail nonetheless. We thought it was important to uh, think about the money and the timeline in a somewhat different way. Need to balance equity, equity with excellence. It, of course, at one level, you'd say we'd love to give the money equally to every trust in the country, but we also said there are trusts at very different stages of their digital journey, and it is also important to identify there are certain trusts that are already pretty good that with some resources and help could be made truly, truly excellent. And we thought that that was a reasonable thing to do. Uh, one of the, the most striking comments that we heard, you know, why aren't trusts going digital? And somebody said to us, if you think about the things that can get a trust CEO fired, not digitizing is not on the list. So we thought it was very important to try to turn that dynamic around to create a dynamic in which the trust CEO said, we have to digitize, we have to get it right, and if I don't do this in a reasonable time frame, that will get me fired. So uh, that was a very important dynamic to turn around. What did we come up with? We thought it was wise to divide implementation into two phases, one now for, for about three years, and a second phase, 2020 to 2023. We also felt it was wise to divide the trusts into three different groups a group that uh, we called A, that's already digitally strong but had the potential to be world-class, a group B that is digitally fair now uh, and ready to advance to the next level. They have the people, they have the resources and culture that with some support they could get to uh, being paperless. And we said there is a group C that is not ready for a major digitization effort and if you throw money at them, there's a decent chance you will be wasting it. They will get it wrong and we thought it was important to delay implementation in that group. Our, our recommendation was to support implementation in groups A and B now, C later, with central resources, but central resources to match local resources. Local trusts have to have skin in the game. It can't be all central money to get this work done. 
and we thought it important in large part because of the failure or the problems with NPFIT, we thought it was important that the local trust should be able to make a decision about which IT system would work best for them, including a homegrown system if that was their, uh, their best choice. Here's structurally and conceptually how we organize it, dividing the world into two phases, phase one and phase two. There's a whole bunch of trusts out there. We said the first thing that should be done is the trust should be divided into these three different buckets, A, B, and C. With the group A, we thought that they are already quite good and they could be made excellent. That is not the language we use in the report, but that, as you know, has morphed into something called the Centers of Global Digital Excellence, and 12 trusts have been selected. I believe they're being announced later about uh, which trusts will receive central support to allow them to achieve a higher level of digital excellence, really to make them as good as any place in the, in the world. For those trusts, they need to have an approved plan. They would get dollars from, uh, from the center, but also have to invest some of their own dollars. They would work on their own progress. They would partner with international leaders. So you could see a trust partnering with a place like my own or Mayo or a Harvard Hospital or a digitally advanced place in another country. Uh, they would help others in their region advance. They would anchor regional efforts to create interoperability in their own area, and they would be world-class within three years. I think that's fully achievable, and this was really a new vision for what might be possible within, uh, within the NHS. The second group, Group B, uh, would be groups that folks that were ready to digitize now. We thought that ultimately there might be a third of the NHS trust, and when you added up the Global Digital Excellence Centers and this group, we thought that in phase one, maybe half of the NHS trust could be digitized. This is a group that doesn't aspire to international prominence, but aspires to digital excellence in their own environment. They would have an approved plan. They too would receive money, uh, but not the complete amount of money to do this. They would work on their own progress. They would partner with the group A, with the digitally excellent folks in their region uh, to support a local network. They would support regional op interoperability. And the goal would be by 2019, 2020, they would be a digitally mature, highly functional digital system. Group C, recall, we said, is not ready to go now. And we thought that was probably about half of the NH Trust. They are deferred for a few years. They're not sitting uh, doing nothing for the next few years. They are being supported to try to get ready to build the workforce, build the culture, sort of till the soil so that they get it right when they do digitize in phase two, and really all of the same dynamics in that group as I articulated for, uh, for group B, just deferred by a few years. 2023, in our mind, is the end of the game, is when the goal is, and a realistic goal, that the entire National Health Service is digital, and we try to codify by that by saying, 2023, there would be no more central money available, and that would be made clear to everyone. It would be difficult to meet quality standards if you were not digital. That's part of why the GP sector digitized so readily, because people knew they weren't going to be able to meet the QAF standards if they weren't digital. And maybe even uh, the CQC deems a trust that is not digital by 2023 to be out of compliance. So the goal here is that people are not able to kick this down the road forever. If you're in Group C, you better be getting ready so that you are successful during Phase 2. The second area that we focused on was uh, the workforce. And we were really struck by the thinness of the workforce of clinician informaticians. I'll use the shorthand CCIOs, but I don't just mean one person in a trust. I mean the workforce within a trust of individuals that can bridge the worlds of informatics and clinical practice. They may be doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and others. The combination of adaptive change and the productivity paradox means that you need to have people at the level of each healthcare delivery organization that understand clinical practice and understand technology and can bridge these worlds. So they, they can be do doctors, nurses, or pharmacists, but they have to have training in both of these dimensions. There's a problem that we found in both supply and demand. There were very few people in the CCO pipeline, really no mature training programs. The field is not professionalized. There's no certification. By the way, in the US, all of these things are different. There's a certification pathway, professional training programs. And it's even worse than that. There were the, the young doctor or nurse who in 2008 uh, said, I really think this is interesting and cool. I want to be a doctor, a nurse, and pharmacist, and an informatician. Well, if you got involved, then NP fit hit and it largely failed, and they said, well, I better find something else to do. 
So any early workforce that might have been developing has gone and found other things to do. It has to be rebuilt. So that's the supply of CCIOs and similar individuals. But on the demand side, it's also a problem. There are, not, there are small numbers in the trusts. They don't have enough time to do the work. Their budgetary uh, uh, authority is, is low. They report somewhere in the middle of the organization. We thought both of these sides needed to be fixed. Here are a couple of quotes from a report that we commissioned from the CCIO network that I think capture the issue. These are from CCIOs. One said, my authority comes from my clinical and technical expertise rather than directly as a consequence of the title and position in the hierarchy. Not holding any budget or having anyone report to me leaves me somewhat, somewhat as an advisor rather than a leader. Another one said, yes, need some training to bring all CCIOs up to a level. Need national recognition that this is really important for the NHS to be fit for the 21st century. My organization feels that a CCO is a nice to have, not a mandatory role that requires time, resource, and investment. We thought this really needed to be rectified in order to succeed. Just as a, as a comparison, my own health system, this is the University of California, San Francisco, uh, 900 beds, 1.2 million outpatient visits a year. We have 15 physicians that have advanced training in informatics, and when you add up the time they have allocated for this work, there are 6.5 full-time equivalents. On top of that, there are additional nurses and pharmacists. Our CCIO is, has 80% of his time allocated to this work and reports directly to the CEO of the health system. When you look at a, a typical large NHS trust of similar size, we found a CCO workforce that maybe had one, three, four clinicians. Sometimes they had one session a week allocated to do this work or two or three sessions per week. Now, I recognize that we spend a lot more money on healthcare than you do. By the way, you should not try to emulate that. We're going broke because of it. But even adjusting for the differences in spend, the investment in this workforce is insufficient uh, when you compare the two systems. So here are our recommendations that, that the trusts need to have a robust clinical information work, informatics workforce, and they need to demonstrate that they either have that or are committed to having that as a condition to receive national funding. These people need to have appropriate authority, time, accountability, report at an appropriate place of the organization, a much higher level status authority than they currently have. But you might say, well, if a trust does that today, where are these people coming from? Well, they need to be produced. So there needs to be a work, workforce training, professionalism, and certification. And we thought it was not unreasonable of a 4.2 billion pound budget to promote digitization of the NHS, allocating 1% of that budget, 42 million pounds, to build the correct workforce seemed to us to be a reasonable investment and parallels the level of investment that we've seen in other uh, digital systems, including that of the United States. We also thought it was quite important that there be a senior person in the NHS to oversee this, and this needed to be a role model, someone who is a clinician and informatics expert and had advanced leadership skills. And so we recommended that there be a national CCIO to lead NHS digitization efforts, largely because when we met with most of the senior people in charge of digitization of the NHS, very, very good people, very committed people, but we probably met the top 10 people and could not identify one who had ever seen a patient. And we said, that's just not going to work. You need someone in there who understands clinical practice. And I'm thrilled to say that Professor Keith McNeil uh, was given this role about a month ago, so even before the results of the report came out, the NHS and the Department of Health acted on them, created the position. Keith, I think, is in the back and is speaking tomorrow. He is fabulous and I think will do a terrific job in this role. Uh, let me say one word about some of the other recommendations that I haven't touched on because of time. I'll go through them very quickly. Clearly, there needs to be a long-term national engagement strategy, particularly getting clinicians engaged in this. Uh, that's beginning to be done now. I think it needs a name. There's been a reluctance to calling this new effort to digitize the NHS a program because the national program uh, has left a bad taste, but there needs to be some name in order to promote uh, uh, the efforts to engage people, and we didn't come up with a name, but we think it's worth doing. I've spoken about these other recommendations, I've spoken about these recommendations. These relate to the implementation. And the final three recommendations, interoperability is really, really important. The GP sector is already wired. Our recommendations mostly are about getting the specialty and hospital sector wired. It would be a tremendous mistake if those didn't weave together seamlessly 
We believe that's possible, and there are already regions in the country that are fairly far along in that. We believe that advanced regional interoperability, meaning within the Manchester region, within the London region, that really data flows seamlessly, we believe that's achievable within a couple of years with the right focus, and we believe that national interoperability, meaning it doesn't matter where you are, your healthcare data can be, uh, can be shared throughout the country, obviously with appropriate privacy and security uh, protections. We believe that's achievable probably by 2022 uh, with appropriate focus. Uh, we also felt that uh, learning networks number eight were very important, I've already mentioned them. And finally, we thought it was really a good idea to have a robust evaluation plan with despite all these recommendations, things will go in unexpected, surprising ways. And it's important to have an outside set of observers, probably from uh, a, an expert from an academic institution in the UK, who's commissioned to uh, look at the program in a rigorous way, probably halfway through it and again at the end, to see lessons learned to make sure that the program adjusts over time. This is the ending of our report. We said the experience of industry after industry has demonstrated that just installing computers without altering the work does not allow the system and its people to reach their potential. In fact, technology can sometimes get in the way. Getting it right requires a new approach, one that may appear paradoxical, yet is ultimately obvious. Digitizing effectively is not simply about the technology, it is mostly about the people. Our recommendations really were designed to achieve that focus on the people. I couldn't be with, more pleased with the support that we've received by really everyone in the country, but particularly uh, by the Secretary of State for Health, by the NHS, uh, by uh, other individuals in the system. It's really been quite gratifying, and uh, I hope these recommendations are useful to you as you go on your journey. This is the report, and that's the web address. It's available now on the web, and thank you so much for your time and attention.